having that transparency, having that clarity as to how much do I currently spend and how much in passive income would I need to be able to cover that so that I don't have to work. That's a very valuable target to have. Hey everyone, I'm Annie Dickerson and on behalf of the entire Good Egg Investments team, I wanted to welcome you to this episode of The Life and Money Show. The show where we talk about everything from investing to financial freedom to parenting, traveling, creating a life by design and everything in between. I'm here with my amazing co-host Susan Elliott and today we have such a fun conversation for you. Today we're talking about can money buy happiness. It is something we've all thought, I am sure. Not one listener can say that they haven't thought, if I just had X amount of money, I might feel a certain way, maybe happier, maybe easier, maybe better, maybe something along those lines. So it's nice to dive into this. And this is the impetus of today's conversation is this new study that came out um, just towards the end of last year that has really put different dollar signs on what different generations think about the amount of money they need in order to be happy, whether that's an annual salary or net worth. So we're going to dive into those numbers and like picking them apart a little bit and then thinking from our own experience, has money given us happiness? (laughs) And if not, or if so, like how are we optimizing that process along the way so that really it comes down to like decoupling the idea of money and happiness for us, I think. I mean, We don't want to rely on anything to give us happiness, I think, externally in that. So we're going to dive into all of that today. And I'm really excited to have this conversation with you, Annie, because I know that we all think critically about this. It's not just about the numbers behind our investing, behind our budgets and saving. It is so much about how we feel about our lives along the way, how we're living our lives along the way, because ultimately we're on this path of life and money to be able to live our dream life, to do what we want to do with our time, to have flexibility and freedom and ease in our daily life. So we're going to dive into all of that. And I would also say that if the listeners are interested in learning a little bit more, seeing more from us, we are also putting a lot of this content up on our YouTube channel. We're really trying to dive into the entire process of money and life out there and creating videos for you along the way. And you can find more of that content by just searching Good Egg Investments on YouTube, just like you would in any search engine, and you'll find some of those great videos All right. So with that, I guess let's start first before we dive into our personal experience, because there's so much here to talk about. But let's start with that impetus you talked about, this new study. So last year, Empower, a financial services company, released the results of a survey conducted by the Harris Poll in August of 2023 that asked over 2,000 Americans ages 18 and over about what they thought the key to financial happiness really was. Turns out, 59% of respondents said that happiness could be bought. And respondents on average said it would take having $1.2 million in the bank to be truly happy financially. And we're going to get into the differences per the generations. But just from that, Susan, what are your thoughts? I mean, most people, 60% of people said happiness could be bought. What do you think? Do you agree? I don't agree. I don't agree at all. And I think that we're spreading out the word happiness too broadly in that. So what do you mean? What are you buying? What would the money do to make your life better or more happier. And I would say like if we do drill down into that, and these are just theories, of course, I read through a good bit of this study and the other findings that they had, but happiness is just so broad. I think that people in responding to this, at least I would in responding to this type of poll, think about like what would make my life just like easy and worry-free. Maybe respondents were also thinking about what types of things make me happy that I need to buy. And if I had X amount of money, I could then buy those things again with no worry or no stress. And it's kind of shocking, the differences here. Now, this is also measured against a similar poll that was done in 2010, a similar study, which has been more or less the benchmark from up until now about like, what is the threshold at which money will make us happy? And then beyond that, it's sort of like, 
marginal returns of every dollar beyond this amount is not going to give you the same amount of happiness as every dollar up until that. And this point was $75,000 of annual income. So in 2010, the average respondent had said, well, at $75,000, or they found that every dollar after that, that an annual earnings someone would make was giving them less proportional happiness up until that point. But these numbers in this study have blown that out pretty wildly. What is your thought about buying happiness and how there's more people these days that think that it can be bought than not? I mean, 60% isn't a huge majority, but... Right, right. It's certainly not everybody, but happiness has always been something on my mind because as a kid, my mom would always ask me, are you happy? Are you happy? And so I always had to assess, wait, am I happy? And Almost every birthday that I can remember when I was a kid, the candles would be lit on the cake and it'd be time for me to make my wish. And I would never wish for like a bike or a Nintendo or whatever it was. I would always just wish to be happy. And I never really Hmm. had an idea what that meant or how much money that meant. I just wanted to be happy. And it wasn't until much later into adulthood that I started to discern this distinction between happiness, joy, and fulfillment. And I think as a kid, I was thinking happiness was all of those things. And in reality, I discovered, and I'll get into this in a bit, through my own experience that happiness is more surface level, as you mentioned, and can be more fleeting. And so while I do partially agree that money can buy happiness to a certain extent, like it can buy the external things, it can buy the luxury goods and the give you more capacity to donate and things like that. Some of those things might only make you happy for a period of time. But then after that, once you get used to that new normal of always flying first class or always staying in the nice suite or whatever it is, that becomes your new normal. And so turns out, even at that level, all the same problems will come back in. So it's not like you're going to perpetually be happy if you have those material things. That's been my experience anyway. This is really similar to the work around the hedonic treadmill, Daniel Kahneman, who is a researcher, a Nobel Prize winning psychologist in the field of happiness and also money, talks about the hedonic treadmill. And this is that sort of like moving level of happiness that we always get to a point where we've attained this next goal, this next level, I have become happy. But as life changes, different impacts come in, different negative influences, and it changes at the context of what you are feeling in that moment. There's sort of like the next level and the next level. And if we get caught on this treadmill, as he calls it, we're always kind of trying to like seeking that next level because we're never really finding a way to be happy with the exact experience combination of our life right now. Yeah. And that definitely rings true with my personal experience a few years ago. As Good Egg was growing very fast, we were very fortunate. Um, So we had more income coming into the business. And at the time, this was before the team that we have in place now, before we really understood overhead and having cash reserves and understanding that the business wouldn't just continue to grow at this trajectory forever. We just thought, we've made it. The business is growing. Let's take all this money out of the business and go celebrate and live life. And so all of a sudden, when you're working a job, you maybe negotiate a small raise every year. And so your income grows by a modest amount. This, I had never had that happen to me before, where all of a sudden my income jumped. And it was a really unique experience because for a long time I had had, after I manifested this beautiful home that we lived in, the next thing that I wanted to work on manifesting was these luxury experiences. So in my mind movie and in my vision board, I had all these photos of these beautiful resorts and first class travel. And that was what I was trying to manifest. And the funny thing is, because the business grew at that pace, all of a sudden, I had the money to be able to do that. And so we did. Actually, it's the funniest thing because almost a couple years ago now, we took the family on a trip to Cabo San Lucas in Mexico. And we stayed at the Waldorf Astoria. And so we pulled out all the stops. We did all the things. We got the suite 
with the private pool. We did all the things. And in fact, to this day, my kids say Mexico is their favorite place in the world because they think it's that, that private pool. They're anyway. We're, yeah. We're you set a bar. To, did you set a right? bar? For no. Them? Oh, oh no. Goodness. Yes. Just there are two sides of every coin, right? But <laughs> anyway, uh, so we had that experience. And we took some other trips where we got to stay in very nice places and experience very nice things. And what I realized was, as I mentioned, the problems didn't stop. It's not like the challenges that I had in life or in work, growing the business. It's not like all of those things just dissolved and disappeared automatically. It was like, Okay, so now I'm sitting in this luxury suite. I have this beautiful view and I still have these things that challenge me. And so I realized those things come from within, not from out there. And so what that ultimately taught me is now I don't have any of that stuff on my vision board. I don't have any of that stuff in my mind movie. It's great. I very much enjoy it. I'm grateful when we get to take those types of trips. And I realize that I want luxury, not out there. I want luxury in here. I mm. want the inner space to be clean and pristine. I want that luxury mm. experience on the inside because then no matter where I go and no matter what material possessions I have, I'm always going to have that joy and fulfillment with me. And so that's been kind of my journey and my experience through it. I did mm -hmm. have the fortune to be able to experience the can money actually buy happiness and i did that and it only lasted for so long mm -hmm. oh that's such a good reflection on it and for those of us who are in this process where we still maybe have the financial goals that we're working for me i think about i it's like my gut knows that's not going to solve my problems, that whatever stress I feel now, whatever anxiety, even if it's directly related to money, like we just had a 650 veterinary bill yesterday because my dog needs a monthly electrolyte shot in order to stay alive. I mean, this is a very important shot. Mm -hmm. And then the tick medicine, the all kinds of stuff. And you're oh, just yeah. like, okay, where's that money coming from? So very real, like financial mm -hmm. thoughts coming in. My gut knows that having the money a certain amount is not going to make me any less stressful, but it does bring up the idea of like that. So what is it that would the money take the stress away? And like, how can I remove that stress now? Or how can I feel at peace and at ease now? You mentioned, I love the way you just talked about having that inner space, inner calm inside your own mind, inside your own heart that you're moving forward that is not connected to the dollar sign. The dollar sign is not going to give that to you. And in fact, like you can have that earlier while you pursue building wealth, because we do want to reach a point where we can have this ability to give, this ability to live in luxury and that kind of thing. But to take that with you along the way, um, it makes me think about these numbers of the generations, frankly. So mm -hmm. Gen Z in this survey noted that they needed $128,000 salary annual and a net worth of about $500,000 in order to feel happy, right? And then the next generation, millennials, of which I'm technically a part of, I'm an elder millennial, as a comedian once said, which I like that term, I'm an elder millennial. The millennials put a number at the number at $525,000 of annual earnings at their level of happiness with a net worth of almost $1.7 million. Now, Gen X is back down to that similar range as Gen Z. That's 130 annual earnings with a net worth a little higher, 1.2 million. And then boomers are 124. So they're the lowest, in fact, of annual earnings with a net worth of about 1 million. And it's interesting that millennials is like skewing this data pretty high. And we think about like, what is it about the millennial generation that maybe sort of attaches happiness to money a little bit more than the others. What would you think be what might be a result of that? And how can we help millennials like me be able to detach that money and happiness tether there? Yeah. So first, before we dive into that, I want to just for any listeners who might be a little bit fuzzy on the generations as I was when I first read this. I was like, wait, how old are Gen Good Z? Good point. And yeah. How old are yeah. Gen X? So Gen Z, these are the young people. Okay. So Gen Z were people who were born between 1996 and 2015. So 
Currently, as we're recording this, Gen Z will be between 12 and 27 years old. So these are the young folks. Mm -hmm. These are either the teenagers. High school, college. Yeah. Yeah. Into the young adulthood years when they're getting their first jobs. Maybe they've been in the workforce for two, three. The elder Gen Zs have been in the workforce for four years. Okay, so Mm -hmm. I can totally understand where $128,000 and a net worth of $487,000 seems like a lot to them. They don't maybe have kids yet, maybe don't have families yet. They're taking smaller vacations. They maybe don't have a lot of paid time off yet. And so they're busy, kind of focused on their careers. Maybe they're still living with roommates. Maybe they move back home and they're living with their parents. Who knows, right? And so to them, six figures seems like a lot. So $130,000 as a benchmark, it makes sense for that age range. Um, And then you've got millennials. And so millennials, also known as Gen Y, I actually didn't know, but that makes sense because Gen Z, Gen Y, Gen X. Anyway, so millennials were people who were born between 1977 and 1995. So currently, this generation is roughly 30 to early Like 43, 44, something. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. So if you think about what's going on in life at this time, millennials currently are getting married, they're growing their families, they're buying their homes, they're moving up in the career ladder, but they're also facing a world where there's high interest rates. They're facing a world where COVID just happened and they're having to navigate the challenges of potentially remote work. They're also the first generation that has started to see social media in their formative years. And so I think that's played a part in our growth and our evolution too, Mm -hmm. is seeing all these things for the first time that other people are doing and feeling like we need to catch up to that. And I think student loans is a big deal here too, because I think millennials are just like, they're still paying student loans. They were part of this generation that was like, go to college. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. And build up these massive loans. We didn't quite understand the amount, I think, that we were putting on students at the time. And while Gen X might have hopefully caught wind that like, hey, don't rack up a bunch of student loan debt. It can cripple you later. But they're also maybe not too far down the line of paying those student loans. So they're not feeling like I've been doing this for 15 years, like $600 a month, $1,000 a month for this amount of time. So I feel like you're right. This is all weighing on them in a different way. Another point of millennials is that they haven't experienced multiple market cycles. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a big kind of swing in the market cycle since COVID. There was an upswing and now there's inflation and downswing. It's harder to purchase a house than it was the preceding 10 or 15 years, which is their entire existence of understanding what it's like to be a human, discounting like early childhood development years. So yeah. That's some good benchmarks for like where millennials are out. What about Gen X? Yeah. So Gen X, this generation includes people born between 1965 and 1976. I can't do that exact math, but I think they're what? Upper upper 40s, 50s. Yeah. Okay. So according to the survey, then Gen X said that they would want a salary of about 130000 and a net worth of about 1.2 million. So, I mean, that tracks because I'm thinking Gen X, these are folks who have been in the uh, in their careers for a period of time. They've probably moved up the ranks and seen some success. And so maybe they're not as worried with having this huge number. They've probably already bought their homes. They're already settled in their lives. Maybe their kids are older. Maybe their kids are already, they're empty nesters at this point. And so they're focused more on stability. It's just a different phase of life. Mm -hmm. Their net worth number did jump up as far as in comparison to Gen Z, where the Mm -hmm. annual incomes between Gen Z, Gen X and boomers were all fairly similar. But the net worth number, and I think that's just a little bit of like, no, it's going to take more 
to be able to last into retirement, to have my money last a little bit long. I think that number, the net worth number for Gen Z is probably a little bit lower. Maybe they're already familiar with the power of compounding. So they think like, well, (laughs) if I had a net worth of about 500K, if I just kept investing that, that'd be super. Hopefully that's what it is because 500K won't last too long into retirement. Surprise. Shocker. Yeah. Okay. And then finally, we have the boomers. So the boomers are people born between 1946 and 1964. So currently, they'll be roughly between 60 and 80 years old. And so these are the folks who many of them have already reached retirement age. And so their benchmarks were 124K as far as salary or income, I guess, and then net worth of just under a million. Yeah. So it makes me think about, do I have a number that all my problems would go away if I just earned X amount of money? And and wondering, like, is there actual value in that too? I mean, I'm a high achieving person. I have goals in different realms of my life. I have running goals, athletic goals, as most of our listeners have probably heard me talk about. And I do have financial goals. I have a FI number, a financial independence number. I know that like, I need to keep growing my investments so that I can retire one day and have this kind of freedom. So like, what is the balance, do you think, Annie, in having sort of a goal that is a dollar sign, that is a number sign, while also like not putting off my happiness until I reach that goal? Yeah. Well, it makes me think about the people who took this survey and the way that they took the survey. Because most people, as we've discovered, haven't done the work to actually figure out their financial independence or financial freedom number. They're just kind of shooting a dart out there, especially if Mm -hmm. they're being asked, what number do you want? And so they're thinking, oh, I'll just pick a number randomly because they don't know. They haven't done that work to figure out, okay, how much do I actually spend on average per month? How much would I need to be able to cover my expenses? Um, So I think it's very valuable to have that insight. And it's going to change as we see through these generations, it's going to change as you get to different phases of your life. But having that transparency, having that clarity as to how much do I currently spend And how much in passive income would I need to be able to cover that so that I don't have to work? I think that's a very valuable target to have because most people will overshoot that number. They'll just kind of fudge it and be like, yeah, I think I'll probably spend 10,000. Let's just round it up to 20,000. And so that means in a year I would need this much and probably would want a little bit more so I could save. And so they're just shooting in the dark. They're just picking a number. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. in reality, I've done exercises on this where even if you write down everything you could possibly dream of that you would ever want in your life, like a yacht, private jet, world-class travel, all of that stuff, you write it all down. And then you actually take the time to research how much that costs. Almost all the time, people think it costs way more than it actually does. And so- Even the private jet? I mean, that's billions, right? (laughs) Right. Well, here's the thing is when you do the research on the private jet, you realize how much work it is to maintain it, especially if you Mm -hmm. really think about how often would I use that private jet? Well, probably only like a few times a year. Well, I don't want a private jet the whole year. Well, you know what? I'm going to rent a private jet. Oh, that's actually a lot cheaper. So it's like these things that people just, they have these high goals that they've never really done the work to really think through. And I think that's Mm -hmm. what leads to some of these inflated numbers. Sometimes I feel that way about my primary residence. I'm like, wow, one day I'm just going to live in Airbnbs. Other people will clean and do the laundry and the yard work everywhere I go. (laughs) But no, that's, yeah, interesting. In another survey question, in this same survey, only 17% of respondents defined financial happiness as reaching a certain level of net worth, which is almost like counter to the numbers that they had just provided. And so I think a lot of this is just like in the way that we're phrasing things. Like you said, if you're like, hey, how much money do you want? Huh? 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 Like, yeah, I'm going to put a lot of money in that answer field of that question. Like open-ended? Are you kidding me? Like, yeah, one million. Sure. Um, But when I really like think about 
how do I feel about is happiness with finances tied to a specific number? And like, well, actually, it's probably more aligned with like being able to have this ease at paying my living expenses. Another thing that they noted was that inflation and high interest rates and student loans were weighing on Americans' financial security and that having the comfort of spending money on everyday items could boost the feeling of financial happiness. Mm -hmm. So even the respondents in this survey kind of were like, yeah, well, that number's great, but really like just being comfortable paying for my normal expenses would really do a lot of good here. Yeah. And you know, I'll share a kind of the flip side of that. And I fully acknowledge I am and I was very fortunate to be in this position to be able to experience this. But I mentioned when the business kind of jumped and grew very quickly, um, I came into a good amount of money more than I had before. And so I was able to loosen the reins on some of the things. And all my life, I grew up, we didn't have very much money at all when I was growing up. And so all my life was taught that money was scarce and that you had to preserve money, watch every cent, be very careful with money. And so I had a lot of guilt, a lot of baggage around money. And so at this point, when I finally could loosen the reins on the spending I was doing, there's a dark side to it. A lot of people are just thinking about the up and up and not the other side. And so what I experienced was actually, yeah, for a period of time, it was very freeing to be able to spend on things, to upgrade things that normally I would have said no to because I wanted to conserve the cash. I was also able to be more generous. I bought more gifts for friends. I donated more to nonprofits. So all of that did feel good until. After a period of time, like you said, that becomes the new normal and a new kind of guilt started to creep in because as I had loosened the reins, I started to think, yeah, I am fortunate enough to be able to do this, but now I'm not even paying attention. Now I'm just throwing this money away. I can, I have the good fortune to be able to walk into a store and buy something without looking at the price tag. but. I'm just throwing that money away now. If I were more conscientious about that money, I could make that go farther. I could donate that. It's like you caught yourself. You're like, wait a minute, I'm walking on a treadmill. Yes. Hang on. I'm still walking on this treadmill. Like suddenly I'm not grateful for this amazing fortune that has come my way. And then I'm just, you caught yourself in setting that new normal. Yeah. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And I still have things to this day that I bought during that period of time in my life where I'm like, what was I thinking? Why did I buy that? I didn't need that. And now I'm not going to use it. And now it's just sitting there. And now it's causing me to feel guilty. But it's a good reminder of that period of time. It was almost like, because the money grew faster than I was prepared for, it challenged my values. And Mm. it had me step into almost this other version of myself that I think I wasn't fully ready for. And so that's why I say there's two sides of it. Yes, it was freeing and it brought me a certain amount of happiness, but there was also the guilt on the other side of it. And it didn't bring me the lasting fulfillment that I thought that it would. I love that you pointed that out. I'm in a similar but opposite moment right now in our own just financial cycles of needing to tighten the reins up a little bit. My husband runs his own business, so we're very It's kind of at the whim of his client work. And I mean, there's many freelancers in our audience who understand that and being able to spread out your income over time. But we're at a point where like, okay, what expenses can we cut back on right now? Um, We wanted to hire someone to come in and do some meal prep once a week. Like, oh, that would be great. But with his low client work, we're like, okay, realistically, like you can do that meal prep work (laughs) for a couple of months at least. But I found myself thinking like, this could be a really kind of, I could take this process as feeling like a failure, feeling like a setback in my progress towards our financial goals. Like, wow, you think that the progress we're making would continually allow us to spend more money, right? But the progress we're making sometimes means that we need to say like, let's check in on things. And what is really bringing us joy in our spending right now? What is really like not necessary? 
from a point of like, yeah, maybe that helps out a little bit, but it's something we can do and it allows us to feel more ease and covering our everyday expenses and being able to say like, well, then when we have his client income come into our life, that it will just be sort of this big bonus on the top. We'll be able to invest more when that comes to it. But we're able to kind of like maintain a stasis point. So there's like this light side to tightening the reins. Yes. That's yes. kind of similar to your dark side of loosening mm-hmm. the reins. It's these moments where we're like asked or forced or called mm-hmm. to inspect what brings us joy. Yeah. And what's bringing us joy with the money that we're spending, how we're spending our time. And it's like those calls to discovering what happiness means to you, I think, that money can help us with. I don't think money can bring us happiness by reaching a certain level, but I think money has the power to cause you to reflect a little bit more about like what brings you meaning and happiness in your life. Because it could be really easy to think that you could buy it all mm-hmm. when really like the research time and time points again to all these other ways that means lasting happiness, like building relationships, the health of our families, the time we spend with friends, the connections we feel to our communities, so much of relationship things and not things, their experiences. And so I hope that our listeners can walk away with this idea of like, use money as a wonderful mirror of how you see happiness and how you can find that in the moment right now. Yeah. And on that note, the last thing I wanted to pull out from This study was that most of the respondents said, especially in the millennial band, said that they would be willing to pay $7 for a daily coffee because of the joy that it brings. And so this is something I mentioned, I grew up with not a lot of money and I was taught to be very frugal. And for my young adulthood life, everything I bought came from Craigslist. It was secondhand. A lot of it was tattered, but well-loved. And I had nothing up on my walls because why do you need art? You just need a couch to sit on (laughs) and a table to eat at. You don't need all that frilly stuff. And so I was very like minimal in everything that I bought and I spent on. But I say that because now it's taken me a long time, but I've gotten to the point where I realize the unseen value of those little things that bring us joy. As an example, I recently um, learned about container gardening, where you get a big like outdoor pot and then you plant some things in it. And because I never really paid attention to it, I always thought, oh, you just get one of those pots and you put one plant in it. But as I learned more about it, I was like, oh no, actually you can put multiple plants in it. It's almost like flower arranging. You kind of put different plants together and they have this very simple thriller, spiller, filler kind of thing. So you have a thriller, which is like the main spotlight plant in there. It's a little bit taller. And then you have the filler, which is like goes around that. And then the spiller, which spills over the edge. And so as I learned about this, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to go out and buy some plants and plants these days are not that cheap. And so Mm -hmm. I probably spent 60 to a hundred dollars on a few plants for this one pot. And then, so I planted the plants in there and in my twenties, if you had told me I was going to take a hundred dollars and spend it on plants, (laughs) I would have said, are you insane? That is the plants die. What? Ever. Yeah. (laughs) No, I'm going to take that and I'm going to buy like a new, like a a table and chairs from Ikea or something like that, right? But what it did was, so I took this container and it sits at the top of our entry stairs going into the house. So every morning as I'm walking up, after I drop off the kids, I walk up, I see these plants and I see the little changes that are happening each day Mm -hmm. and the flowers that are popping up and the growth of the leaves, the spread, all of this stuff. And what it does for me is it gives me this little boost of energy. And this is where the woo comes in a little bit because this is something that I never put value in before. I thought, no, you just focus, you use your brain, you do the work, you buckle down, and that's what's going to get you results. And now what I've realized in my life with the abundance, the trust that I've brought in is that we're all energy. Everything's energy. 
And so if you can get that little burst of energy, that pays you every day. That's more than the $100 that I put into it. It's more than the $7 that I would put into the coffee. It pays me back much more because of the joy that it inspires. And then I can go and turn that into a lot more inspired work or connection than I would have done before with an empty tank. And so this gets back to the self-care and the self-empowerment that we've talked about in previous conversations. I love that you just said like, it pays me. I've always thought like, well, what are the five points of joy that you experience on your daily life? But like, no, it's like paying me money, almost like put that in your budget, the income I get, the energy that I get, the joy that I get from seeing the new little plant growth. I know exactly what you mean. I definitely went down the houseplant journey in COVID. (laughs) Now we have a jungle in our living room and it's extraordinary. Every time a new leaf, I'm like, kids, kids, come over here. Look at this thing unfurl. It's a magic. It's so beautiful. I love it. And they're like, yeah, yeah, mom, because they just live in a jungle. There, you're pretty used to it now. Right. Um, Right. (laughs) But yeah, and my cappuccino, my espresso every morning. Every morning. That was like one of the best purchases of my life was this nice coffee machine. So like, what is that paying you in happiness? Yeah. Yeah. One quick thing on the plants, because we have a bunch in our house too. One fun thing, because I know you have young kids, if you get a jeweler's loop, and they're like $10 on Amazon. And they're like these little like super magnified things. And then you can put it up to the leaf And it's super cool because you can see it from a whole new perspective. You can almost start to see like the cells in the leaves. And I've done it with flowers too. It's just super fun. Oh, okay. Yeah. We'll do that after school. (laughs) That sounds great. I think we've got some magnifying glasses. that $10 will buy you a little bit of happiness there. (laughs) All right. Well, with that, thank you everyone for joining us um, for this episode of the Life and Money Show. And hey... As you are thinking about your life and money and the happiness that maybe the joy, the fulfillment in your life, perhaps passive investing through real estate syndications or group investments are a part of that journey. And if you're at the start of that journey and just learning, dipping your toes into what passive investing is all about, a great place to start is our Start Here page. So you can go to goodegginvestments.com slash start and we'll walk you through everything you need to know about passive investing, help you start to figure out your financial freedom number, something that we talked about in this conversation and help you start to figure out whether real estate investing is right for you to help you reach your goals and to bring that joy and that fulfillment and that lasting happiness into your life. For show notes or to listen to previous episodes, please go to lifeandmoneyshow.com. And for more information on how to invest with us and create passive income and build wealth for your family, we invite you to join the Good Egg Investor Club. Just go to goodegginvestments.com slash invest. And if you enjoyed this episode, it would mean the world to us if you would subscribe, share this podcast with a friend and leave us a five-star review so we can continue to bring you incredible new conversations all about life and money. Till next time, remember that your financial journey is a lifelong adventure and we are here with you every step of the way. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.